Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. Whether you're here in the room or you're watching online, so glad you're taking time out of your weekend to be here. Uh, if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Cale. I serve on staff here as the creative arts director. And uh, we're going to, we're kind of in the, in the process of wrapping up this series called Baggage Check. We're in the seventh week of this series. Uh, and then next week, if all goes according to plan, Pastor Brant will be back to wrap up this entire series. But what we've been doing in this series, we've been talking about baggage that you and I uh, carry. And, and the things like ongoing sin or our past, past hurts uh, and bitterness, anxiety, conformity. Last week, Matt was here and talked about religion. And our goal with this entire series is to take the baggage that you and I carry uh, and to Put it at the foot of the cross because that is the only place that it can be dealt with correctly and completely, right? Because if we're honest with ourselves and with each other, it's going to happen. It's going to annoy the crap out of me. All right. Um, if we're honest with ourselves and with each other, like I don't have the capacity to handle my own baggage or the strength to handle my own baggage, much less handle yours and vice versa. And so the only place that we get to completely and totally handle our baggage is at the foot of the cross. Because if I try to handle it on my own or you try to handle it on your own, we've simply made church a self-help seminar where you might leave feeling better about yourself, maybe not. But our whole goal in this series, and as we, as we do church, right, our whole goal is life change, is that you can be able to take something from today and apply it to your tomorrow. The whole goal is to be more like Jesus. So the topic that we're going to kind of center ourselves around today in this baggage series is called, we're going to call it worthlessness, all these different things we talked about in the last six weeks, ongoing sin, our past, past hurts and bitterness, mental health and anxiety, conformity, religion, all of these things, if not dealt with properly and completely, can lead us to feeling worthless. And so to set the foundation for what we're talking about today, we're going to talk about love. Now, I think we can all agree that there are multiple types or kinds of love, right? I love tacos, Everybody's like, yeah, you do. I love tacos, but I love my wife. Now, I got in trouble last night because apparently I held my hands at the same level when I said tacos and my wife. So, I love my wife. I love tacos. Okay? Just to be clear. But there's these different types of love. So, we're going we're gonna to funnel this down to two types of love uh, for our, the sake of our conversation today. And the first kind of love is a love that loves because the object is valuable. Okay? A love that loves because the object is worthy of love. A love that loves because an object is valuable. And this is a love that you and I know really well, right? Because we've earned it. We've worked hard for it. You love your new countertops. Maybe it's your car, or maybe it's your home, or maybe it's your outfit today because everyone's saying, you look real good. Maybe it's your outfit. Maybe it's a baseball card collection. Whatever it is, it's a love that loves because the object is valuable. Now, the problem we run into is that there are times that I don't feel valuable. There are seasons that we go through, that I go through, where we don't feel valuable. There are times we don't feel like we, we measure up, that we don't meet the standards or expectations of ourselves, much less the standards and expectations of your parents or your spouse, your kids, your family, your coworkers. And if I can't live up to those standards, if I can't live up to my own standards and expectations, how am I supposed to live up to, to God's standards and his expectations for my life? And so we begin to question our value. Insecurity begins to, to creep in and we question our worth and we question whether we're capable of showing love and capable of being loved. And maybe for some of you, you've stopped questioning your value and you've begun to believe that you're worthless. Maybe your language has changed from a question of do I have value, do I have worth, am I lovable, it's changed from a question to a statement. I have no value. I am worthless. No one can love me. 
It's made it from our head to our heart. And for whatever reason, you've bought into the lie that you have lost your value, that you are worthless and unlovable. Okay, so first there's a love that loves because the the object is valuable. The second kind of love that we're going to talk about is a love that loves and gives value to that object. A love that loves, not because the object is valuable, but because it gives value to the object. You love something and give value to that object. So we're going to do a little class participation here for a moment. In your, in your imagination, in your mind, in your brain, I want you to think of something that might not have significant monetary value, but it's something that you have loved or that you currently love. Maybe it's a toy or a stuffed animal. Maybe it's a blanket. I, I have, it's, it's a giant quilt, blanket, whatever you want to call it. And it's orange and green and it's ugly as sin, but I love it because my mom told me that my great grandma made it. Okay? So these things that are tattered and torn that, that to the ordinary person, there's really no monetary value. Maybe it's uh, your first car. Um, but the paint's chipping off of it now. And you know, like these things that you take with you everywhere. But the chances are that whatever you have in mind has little to no monetary value. And maybe it did at one point, but as people look at it now, it's worthless. For me, it is this guitar. Now, this guitar my parents gave me when I was probably 13 15 years old, so 20 some odd years ago, and it has been around the block. It has been on mission trips and road trips. It's gone with me to Colorado Springs, and I went to school out there. This is the guitar that I first started leading worship on. Um, It used to have a battery compartment here with an actual door instead of tape, which is what all that residue is. Um, All the internal electronics have gone out, and so this little tan piece here cost more than the whole guitar did, um, and now it doesn't work. Um, I gave it to my brother for a while. We swapped the guitars, and it came back with this hole in it, uh, which is pretty awesome. This one is meant to be there. This one's not. <laughs> um, there was a black pick guard on here, and I decided one day, just randomly, just to rip it off. Uh, they use a really strong adhesive to keep the pit guards on. I didn't know that. Uh, and so it ripped all the finish off. Um, I did discover, I don't know if you, if you can see it here or not, but there's this giant line that runs down the body of the guitar. Um, this, it's, it's made of a really soft wood. And so one day I just had my guitar pick and I just ran a line down. It's worthless, right? In anybody else's eyes, this guitar really doesn't have much monetary value, but in my eyes, Right? In the eyes of the owner of this guitar, it is priceless. It's, per- it's, it's imperfect, it's broken, it's flawed. A lot of times it's out of tune, it's been sitting in its case. Like there's literally dust on here that I can, yeah. It's been in its case for six months. And it's out of tune, but it's my guitar. And I, f- I think this is a perfect example of how God feels about us, right? We're, we're broken and imperfect. We are, <laughs> our finish has kind of rubbed off a little bit. Um, our electronics don't work the way they used to. Uh, and we're out of tune, right? And sometimes we, we, we can tweak enough things. We play the right notes at, at one time or another. But before long, we're out of tune again. He sees all the flaws and the scars on the outside. And he sees the, and knows the secrets that we have on the inside. But it's never stopped God from pursuing and loving me, much like all of the the flaws of this guitar and the character of this guitar, it hasn't stopped me from loving this guitar, even to the point I might love it even more now with all the flaws than I did before. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we, were, while we were still broken and out of tune, while we were still sinning, 
While we were still disobeying and breaking the heart of God, he displayed his love for us. While we're still carrying the baggage of yesterday or last year or a lifetime, God loved us and sent his son for us. But this, is, this, this kind of love, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? Like you, it's really easy to say God loves you or God loves me, but when you really think about how this love happens, it's impractical, this unconditional, immeasurable love. And it's the kind of love that doesn't look for worth in an object, but it's the kind of love that gives value to an object. It's illogical and doesn't make sense. And we're going to we're going to hear for a moment, look at three different examples uh, within some parables that Jesus told of this kind of illogical love. So if you have your Bibles or your, or your notes, I would love for you to turn to Luke chapter 15. And we're going to look at three different parables that Jesus tells. And you're, you're probably familiar with all of these, but the whole chapter starts with, with kind of setting the scene. It says, tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. And this made the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. Now, real quick, eating with someone in the Jewish culture, you know, there was a high level of honor or dishonor. And so you have the right people doing the right thing, eating in your home, and it brings honor on to your household, okay? So Jesus, eating with tax collectors, right, the worst of the worst, and other notorious sinners would bring in this whole, in this Jewish culture, bring dishonor onto this house. In verse 3 it says, so Jesus told them this story. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that was lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. Okay, so example number one, sheep. Example number two, Starts in verse 8. It says, Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Won't, won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she will call her friends and neighbors and say, Rejoice with me because I have found my lost coin. So we have a sheep. We have a coin. And the third parable that Jesus tells is about the prodigal son or the lost son. And so the Cliff Notes version of this is there's a son who wanted his half of the inheritance. His brother was still working on the farm, but his dad was kind and gracious and gave him his half of what he was owed. And so the son left and, and spent all of the money, every single cent of it. And he found himself sleeping with pigs because he had nowhere else to stay. And he's wondering if the food that the pigs were eating would be better than what he was having. And scripture says that he finally came to his senses and decided to come home. So we pick up the story in, in verse 20. It says, so he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, the father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. And while you're at it, kill the calf that we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine was dead and it has now returned to life. He was lost and is now found. And so the party began. So you have these three different examples of, sh of a sheep, a coin, and a son. Now, I don't know if uh, when you look at me, you think outdoorsman. Probably not the right thing to say. Okay. Uh, how many of you have seen the movie Madagascar? Okay. My spirit animal is like Melman the giraffe, right? Nature, it's all over me. Like that's, 
That's kind of how I view the outside. Okay, I don't know a whole lot about livestock, about sheep, but here's what I do know. Is that sheep are stupid. <laughs> right? Sheep are dumb. And I don't think it's a coincidence that, that Jesus parallels us with sheep. <laughs> right? We're pretty messed up. We tend to wander off. Uh, we, we really don't think about our decision. Uh, we really don't have a sense of direction. We get lost easily. But, but the good shepherd searches until the sheep has been found. He didn't stop when it got dark. He didn't stop to take a nap. And it's not like he had to just go around the corner to find this thing. He had to go out into the wild and to the unknown and, and into the nature and find the sheep. Now, I don't know if you've ever had a dog run off from your backyard or not, but my dog has run off, and when I find it, I do not throw it over my shoulders and give it a ride home. It's usually like, <laughs> I don't abuse my dog, calm down. <laughs> but usually I'm not carrying my dog home. But the shepherd throws this sheep over its shoulders and lets it relax for the walk home. He's a better owner than I am. And then he threw a party when he got home. And we have the story of the coin. This, this coin was not easily found, but the search was relentless. This lady lights all the lamps that she has and sweeps the entire house, listening and looking for the coin on the uneven ancient rock floor. Now, she doesn't search the way my kids search for things. Walk into a room, look at the ceiling, and tell me that it's not there. She was relentlessly, diligently searching for the coin until she found it. And I think far too often, we, just as people, whether you're Christian or not, far too often we feel like God just gives up on us, much like we would give up on a lost coin. After all, like, she had nine more. Eventually, it will pop up. She'll move the couch or she'll move the bed and then it'll, you'll hear it hit the floor. Like, oh, I found my coin. But she searched until it was found. And I guarantee you that the party that she threw once the coin was found, the party with her friends and her neighbors, it cost far more than the coin did because it was only a day's wage. But because of your value to God, this is his posture towards us, that he's actively pursuing us and he never gives up. And then the third story is the, the lost son. And this is probably one of my favorite stories in all of scripture. You have a foolish son who took his portion and squandered it all on the world, on what, what felt good. And then you have a loving father who let him go. He didn't try to change his mind or convince him to stay. The father let him make his own decision. And he didn't, the, the father didn't have to, to sit on the porch and look at the horizon to try to find his son. The father didn't have to welcome him back. And even if he did welcome him back, he, he had every right and every reason to treat him as a servant, if not less. He had every right to make the son repay everything that he had taken. But instead of making him repay everything that was taken, he gave him the best of the best. He gave him the best robe and the best ring and the best sandals in the house and killed the calf that they were fattening for a big occasion and threw a party. Now, I think if we take a step back from this passage for just a moment, if we kind of look at this from a 30,000 foot view you know, Jesus is this master storyteller and creates these parallels between our lives and the stories in Scripture. And, and G, the, this whole narrative starts off with Jesus eating and associating with sinners, the worst of the worst, these notorious sinners, and he's made a place for them at the table. And Jesus is telling these Pharisees, these, his critics, that I welcome sinners I eat with them and I treat them like old friends because all people, regardless of whether they're tax collectors or religious leaders, all people are wayward like sheep, bear my image like a coin, and are my children. All people 
are wayward like sheep, bear my image like a coin, and are my children. You see, Jesus doesn't see humanity the way that you and I see humanity. He doesn't see the the arbitrary lines that we draw or the categories that we put people in based on their social status or their race or how much money they have or whether they're married or single or whatever it might be. But he sees all people like wandering, image-bearing children of infinite value. So he says to his critics, like, you you can go back to your synagogues. You can go back home, lock the doors, because you don't see people the way that I see people. You don't see the way that I see. These are like my kids. And I understand that they're prone to wander, but they, they bear my image in their mind, and their value is infinite in my heart. Eternal, infinite value. See, God doesn't love you because you're worthy, right? There's nothing you can do to make yourself worthy, but God's love makes you worthy through his grace and through his goodness. Therefore, love isn't just an action or a verb. Love isn't just what God does. It's who he is. It is his essence. Your worth is not predicated on what you can do or how good you can be. Because you can never be good enough to be worthy. The only way that we're made worthy is through God's finished work on the cross. In 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 8, at the very end of verse 8, it says, God is love. And this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. If you were here two weeks ago, we talked about the old way of doing things, the old law, the sacrificial system, and we kind of concluded there's not enough animals on planet earth to atone for our sins, right? In the old sacrificial system, but this says that he loved us and sent his son as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And then this set of scriptures ends with verse 11. It says, dear friends, since God loved, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. See, the problem is, if you're anything like me, that I more often than not tie my value and my significance and my worth to temporary and arbitrary things. And I'm also guilty of tying the worth of someone else to temporary and arbitrary things. But the way that God ascribes value is profoundly different than how we ascribe value. God sees things as valuable that we see as dismissible. God sees us as value even when we're ready to give up on ourselves and the person that you're ready to give up on, God still values. See, the world tells us that if someone is lost or broken or displaced or maybe they've hurt you or they've hurt someone that you loved, then they've lost their value. That we can can dismiss them. But God doesn't ascribe this, isn't on the same value scale that we're on. God loves a person that has hurt you and abandoned you and abused you. And, and the, the person that has helped create the baggage that you carry, God loves them as much as he loves you. God loves the worst of the worst. The tax collectors, right? These notorious sinners. God loves them as much as he loves us. Why? Because we are all wandering, image-bearing children of infinite value. So the question that we have to be confronted with and we have to wrestle with is, where is our worth found? Where is our worth found? Is it, is it, have you placed your worth and your value into something that is temporary and arbitrary? Have you tied your worth to a relationship or to a job, to your family or your spouse, where in all of these scenarios, in all of these arenas of life, there is a high likelihood that something or someone is going to hurt you? 
there's a high likelihood that something or someone is going to let you down and fail you. Scripture tells us that our worth can only be found in the finished work of Jesus. It cannot be found anywhere else. It can only be found in Jesus, the one who came for us while we were still sinners, while we were still out of tune and showed us what love is. Because if something is loved, it's valuable. If something is loved, it's valuable. See, Scripture tells us that God's love is total, that it reaches every corner of our human experience, the the physical, emotional, spiritual, and mental experiences. God's love is total. It's wide, and it covers the breadth of our own experiences and reaches to the whole world. God's love is long, and it continues the length and duration of our lives. It is high because it rises to the heights of our celebration and our elation. God's love is deep as it reaches into the depths of our discouragement, our despair, our depression, and even death. So we started off this whole conversation by by asking, what is one thing that you can take from today into your tomorrow? What is one thing that you can use today and move into your tomorrow to become more like Jesus? What's the practical application? How do we put our faith into action. I want to give you three scriptures that I think can help you do this as you move into your tomorrow. The first one comes in Proverbs 4.23, and it says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. We talked earlier about moving from questions to statements, right? These questions of do I have worth or do I have value? Am I lovable? And those questions have maybe for you turned into the statements of I'm not valuable, I'm not lovable, I'm not worth anything. And it's made it from your head to your heart and now you believe that you've lost your value and your worth and your ability to love and be loved. But scripture tells us to guard your heart to renew your mind, renew your thoughts, and know who God has made you to be. The second scripture is 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, and it says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. In other words, we use the word of God to tell us who we are and where we find our worth, value, and significance. Scripture tells us that I'm not alone and I'm never abandoned. It tells me that God is for me and not against me. It tells me that I'm seen and valued and known and wanted. Scripture tells me that the king of kings, the the creator of the universe, the one who spoke and galaxies appeared, calls me a cherished family member and has a seat for me at his table. And I understand that I'm not perfect. There's a lot of times that I'm out of tune, right? There's a lot of times that I'm I'm prone to wander, but as I wander, I'm an image-bearing child of infinite value. The last scripture is Philippians 4, starting in verse 8, and it says, now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all that you have learned and received from me. Everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. So we guard our hearts. We make every thought obedient to Christ by renewing our mind. And then we fix our thoughts, we fix our minds, we fix our focus on what is true, which is Jesus. On what is honorable, which is Jesus. We we fix our thoughts on what is pure and lovely and admirable, which is Jesus. We think on things that are excellent and praiseworthy, which is Jesus. And then the God of peace will be with us. 
Because if we fix our focus on things in the world, right, we fix our focus on what is here and now and temporary, there's not a whole lot of peace. And then insecurity creeps in. All the doubts and the questions and the statements begin to take root. But when we fix our focus on what is true and honorable and pure and lovely and admirable, excellent and praiseworthy, then we can know and believe that God has made us in his image and that we're, how we have infinite value in his heart. Wandering image-bearing children of infinite value. Let's pray. Lord, I, I don't want to admit, but I feel like there are more times than not that I don't feel like I measure up or I don't feel like I'm valuable enough. But Lord, your, your word tells us that even though we fail and we're out of tune and we, we mess up, Lord, we're still worthy and valuable in your eyes. So I pray that as we go into a new week, as we go into our schools and workplaces, as we're with family and friends and just all the different arenas of life that we find ourselves in, Lord, help us to carry ourselves like image-bearing children of infinite value. Lord, help us to bring to mind, Lord, I pray that you will bring to mind moments where you have been good and faithful and true and where we can find our value. Lord, help us to guard our hearts, renew our minds, and help us to focus on what is true and right and good, which is you. We praise your name. Amen.